I often say on this channel that poetry is the verbal representation of human life and experience organized into highly disciplined verbal events. And that's a, that's a pretty safe, even generous, classical definition of poetry. But postmodern and contemporary forms will often challenge that definition, evading neat taxonomy and categorization by their experimental and uh, sometimes even nonverbal expressions. I want to give you a sneak peek at one of the poems in this lecture. Uh, this, this is a poem by Susan Howe. A unique form of poetry made up of collaged fragments from the private writings of the John, Jonathan Edwards family private papers at the Beinecke Rare Book Library. Uh, this poem and other poems like this were inspired by Susan Howe's experience in the archives, viewing different manuscripts, sermon notebooks, uh, books and pamphlets of the 18th century American theologian Jonathan Edwards and his family. But how would you define a poem like this? And we're going to return to this tor towards the end. But in this lecture on postmodern and contemporary poetry, I want to explore how poetry has taken on a transpersonal and even transgeographical sometimes even redemptive and spiritual valence since the mid-20th century. And in a way, I think that many of the contemporary poets, the postmodernists, have accomplished what the modernists were attempting to achieve. Um, and all this is in the recent uh, decades. So last lecture, we looked at the modernists. We looked at this underlying struggle between, or underlying, rather, the modernist poetry, uh, writ large, how it holds together the fragments of a fragmented world, aims to connect uh, other lives with our own, and in some respects, to even critique the modern world. We saw this in Auden's poem, The Shield of Achilles. It's definitely a critique of the modern world. And also how they want to sustain the human spirit amid the chaos of modern experience. So welcome everyone to our lecture on contemporary poetry. This is the last lecture in our series through the movements of English poetry. We began with four lectures on background, two lectures on the Bible, uh, one on Greek uh, literature, one on Roman literature, analyzing their effects, uh, lasting effects upon traditions of English poetry. And then we began with, with old, old English, and now we finally arrived at our own age. And we'll be reading uh, poems that were written as early as 2014 in this lecture. And so I'm joined over Zoom by my Patreon supporters who are helping me make the study of poetry accessible to readers outside the university. And they're going to join me afterwards for discussion. They've brought a few poems of their own we're all going to talk about. So if you would like to support my work and join our community of fellow readers and learners uh, of all kinds and of all uh, educational backgrounds, you can find more information about my Patreon uh, in the link below. So tonight, in our last lecture in the series, I want us to think about connections. How contemporary poetry is a connecting hermeneutic that aims to interpret or at least arrange the fragments of modern life into something that can be either experienced or interpreted, or where meaning is impossible to interpret to achieve a toleration of meaninglessness. It aims to connect voice and form in its expression of life, and I think it aims to connect past traditions that we've even explored in this series. Modernism was largely a response to the psychological, the, the social, and the global destabilization and displacement produced by the large changes in society and culture. And modernist poetry has gathered it happens in the wake of this traumatic and irreparable fragmentation. Much postmodernist and contemporary poetry is composed on the ruins of language. We were talking about Jacques Derrida at the end of last lecture, and I think Cam um, mentioned it as well. As this is perhaps um, the separation between modernist and postmodernist. 
was this huge change that occurred in the 20th century when the French deconstructionist Jacques Derrida put forth his, his theory um, of grammatology. Now in Western thought, traditionally for uh, centuries, language had been considered a referential system that is rooted or that refers to a transcendental larger meaning. So when I say the word tree, for example, it's a four-letter word or signifier that refers to the idea of a tree. The word creates a sound vibration from my mouth to your ear, invites the listener, the hearer, to partake in the shared idea of the tree, the fundamental reality of the tree. That's how language is thought to work. This is what's called logocentrism, the idea that there's this idea of the tree that we can both access through, through language. It's the tradition of Western philosophy that regards words and language as a fundamental expression of external reality and completely capable of representing and communicating truths about this reality. But Jacques Derrida's 1967 of grammatology argued that Western theology and philosophy enslaved the sign by prioritizing this transcendental signified um, that the sign pointed to this original meaning. So for Derrida, there really is no idea of the tree. There's no objective idea of the tree. There are only ideas of trees. So when I say tree, um, I mean the sum total of what makes up my experiences of trees. I'm from Louisiana, so when I say tree, I might think of a live oak. Whereas someone from the Pacific Northwest might think of a fir tree. But even if the word tree referred to a specific tree, it would, it would still not be this idea that exists in the realm of Plato's ideas, this transcendental realm. It would really be the, our perceptions of the tree and our memory of those perceptions, which would differ, a collective experience of trees. So what is signified Derrida argued, is not a unified idea that exists in something like Plato's ideal world, but rather a textured fabric of associations. There's this uh, difference. The words differ to other words, other associations, other signifiers. So Derrida's post-structuralism broke down the oppositions between sign and signify. And he argued that one signifier does not lead to a concrete signified. Rather, it leads to another signifier, which in turn leads to another, to another, and so on, in this endless chain of signification. And on a verbal level, an entirely new kind of poetry, I think, comes out of this. Let's think back on our lectures on Old English and Middle English poetry back in March of this year and read some of the poems of the contemporary poet Caroline Bergvall. Bergvall is a French-Norwegian poet who has lived in England since the late 80s. Her work is inspired by Old English and Old Norse texts. And it often, her poetry often involves a recital, a performance of poetry into audio text and sound art performances. So remember the Remember the vast nautical sense of isolation residing within the old English elegies, the seafarer, um, even some of the longing and the wife's lament. We saw in that lecture on Old English, the seafarer is an expression of homesickness and yearning, the voice of one in the hostile oceanscapes of the sea, longing for the domestic world. Nature often figures as this isolating space set apart from the domestic and the social. And then after setting up that, that distinction, that oceanic desolation of the seafarer, the poem builds its tension in comparison with the delights of land. Uh, Ezra Pound translated this poem, I think I mentioned. I'm going to put up some poems here by Burke Ball from her book Drift, published in 2014 and see if you can hear the old English elegy. Let me speak my true journey's own true songs, 
I can make my sorry tale right soggy truth, soggy, sogskate, some serious wreck in my ship, sailing, wreckies, tell who ick, how ache, racked from travel, g'day swindled, oft thrown about, bitterly tested, g'banging head, kneeling at every beating waves, what cursed fool grimly beshipped, couldn't get signs during many a night waco, caught between what's gone, okay, what's coming on crossing too close to cliff, to the cliffs, blow, wind, blow, anon am I. Song two. Cold, gesprung, weary, worn, where my feet frost-bound in the ice-blinding clamor of Kula. City sank further, seafaring as sea fodder, heart humbling. Could scarcely move or draw my breath, cursed with nightmares, gewacked by sea chops, gave up all parts of me on ye battered ship. Yet, a hunger in and mine stole me to more weird comas. Let me, let me, let me, let me freeze. Blow, wind, blow, anon am I. Song three. Stormed by winter land fell away. This one doesn't know fact no man knows that one has no weight. See folded and folded me, okay, loved ones, okay, landed fullness, okay, filled promises, can't ache, for him nor him, for ache nor praises, nor raised love skirts, nor rings, nor harping, nor all round loveliness, how ache. Miserable now, heaven knows, last living soul be hung with ice castles. Hail, hail, hard, nothing else get heard, get heard, but sky butting against sea, sky against sea, against sea, again sky. Blow, wind, blow, anon am I. The last one, north one. Sailed on due north, 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 norit, north, north, north. Give or take a few transmission errors when steering by the sun, okay, the stars, okay, prevailing winds, okay, birds, okay, feeding grounds, due north skirting shorelines, rock ledging from view to view, following tidal streams, visibility good, horizon divided, navigation possible, safe northing for three days, for 15 days, for seven days, for 30 days, for 40 days. Before and hitting the banks, okay. Knolls of the North Sea holes, here nocturnal shoals, herrings, silver trail, release away the northern sword Avalon. I want to return to song one. Let me speak my true journey's own true songs. There's the musicality, and she is an excellent perform performer. I've Listen to how she performs it, uh, how she performs it, and I've, I've tried to do that, but you should definitely check it out. I've got links to that in the description to the video, and I'll post that on Patreon, too. Absolutely enchanting. The rhythm itself is almost its own logic. But you notice the old English who here, um, in what manner or how, tells how ick is the archaic I or the English variant the old English variant of I. But the inhabitation of the speaker comes out first modern English, but then here, separated from us by this archaic breath. We have the past participles, very much old English, with the ge prefixed, as it would be in much old English poetry. And the lack of punctuation, although there is capitalization, which I find that fascinating. The lack of punctuation lends a sense of separation as well, or a, a constancy, 
continuity as though we're picking up a radio signal from a lost ship. The spirit of the old English elegy is beautifully captured in this. But there's also the presence of the Middle English sense, the mythological sense. We, in the Old English, or rather in the Middle English lecture, we, we dealt a little bit with Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, reading just the first 18 lines of the general prologue. But he has a poem, The, the Man of Law's Tale, which is this hagiography. It, it's a mystical tale, often called the tale of Constance, Constance, young woman who is in a boat and is carried by the hand of Providence over the seas to new lands, and sometimes magically, you know, one of her journeys takes something like over 10 years. But this is a saint's tale. And so we have that as well. Um, and by the way, just checking the chat here in our Zoom meeting, Cam suggests that the OK, perhaps, yes, does the OK function as a sort of punctuation? And I think it, it definitely did, especially in song three. Because I was like checking the dashboard, um, the horizon dashboard, orientation, reading. Okay, checking to make sure everything's all right. I find that just rhythmically, absolutely, a kind of punctuation. And T.S. Eliot said his definition of poetry, he said, verse, whatever else it may be, is a system of punctuation. And punctuation is not always, of course, a period or a comma. It's also the line endings, the blank space the repetition of these filler words that take on significance in these interesting ways. So I absolutely think you're right on there, Cam. I, I would be interested to hear what others say as well. We've got the old English sense of Constance on the sea. It's also a, a tale from John Gower's Confessio Amantis. I think it's just called the tale of Constance. 14th, 15th century. And we have this too. Anon am I... No. Uh, it's old-fashioned, informal. We could mean a little while. See you anon, we'll often hear. See you at a time. But it's off. I think it's, it's the abbreviation of the word anonymous. If you have an anthology that goes back to Old English, goes back to Middle English poetry, you'll find that most of the lyrics there are written anonymously. And the editors at the bottom of the, of the poem will write anon, period, as an abbreviation for anonymous. And here at the end of the song, this I identifies herself, himself, as anon, identifies without identity. And I want to move to North 1. North, it's fascinating, the repetition of North, it's frantic. Uh, north being the symbol in human consciousness for human orientation upon the seas and land. It's a way to north. North is a way to locate oneself within the world. The direction to which the invisible pull of the geomagnetic field swings the needle of the compass. Or it's, it's you think of the North Star, the sort of cosmic directional awareness through astronomical signification. It's a way of reading and looking up at the sky, and then reading yourself. But the language with this repetition, north, 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 north. It's the repetition of the signifier, or rather the signifier in all of its Old Norse and Old English and medieval variants, is trying to achieve, it seems, the stabilization that only the signified could give, north itself. And then it ends with that mythological place here, Sword Avalon. Release away the northern sword Avalon. Avalon, of course, the mythical island that, that figures in Arthurian legend. It first appeared in Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kingdom of Britain. And that was written in 1136. But it's the place uh, there where King Arthur's sword, the Excalibur, was made. And it's later where Arthur was taken to recover from being gravely wounded. And we saw that come up in the Victorian lecture with their interest in medievalism. We have a sense, it's poignant here, Sword Avalon, 
that the postmodern self is wounded as well, searching for the orientational bearing in the austerity of a hostile oceanscape. And Bergvall beautifully captures the remote sense of this that the old English elegy captures, I think. Also sword meaning, uh, Avalon sword being something to, to conquer, to organize, and Avalon being the place to heal. Um, it's redolent with possibility. I want to turn to another poem on movement, on journeys, on transits from one state to another and yet never arriving. In a postmodern world without telos or destination, the journey itself is endowed with sacred meaning. And this is true for even um, ontologies and epistemologies with telos. And you have the pilgrimage in the medieval world or the journey of the errant knight. Uh, so, 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 but there, that, that secret, that sacred rather meaning of the journey in transit is retained here in this poetry. In this living in transit between one world and time, between bodies and minds, uh, in the tossing on the disinterested oceans of existence, this is where meaning happens. This is where meaning happens. I want to turn to Jory Graham's poem. We'll get there soon. Jory Graham, The Geese. Today as I hang out the wash, I see them again. A code as urgent, as elegant, tapering with gold. For days they have been crossing. We live beneath these geese, as if beneath the passage of time, or a most perfect heading, sometimes I fear their relevance. Closest at hand, between the lines, the spiders imitate the paths the geese won't stray from, imitate them endlessly to no avail, Things will not remain connected, will not heal, and the world thickens with texture instead of history, texture instead of place. Yet the small fear of the spiders binds and binds the pins to the lines, the lines to the eaves, to the pincushion bush, as if at any time things could fall further apart and nothing could help them recover their meaning. And if these spiders had their way, chain link over the visible world, would we be in or out? I turn to go back in. There's a feeling the body gives the mind of having passed something, a bedrock poverty, like falling without the sense that you are passing through the one world that you could reach another any time. Instead, the real is crossing you, your body, an arrival you know is false, but can't outrun. And somewhere in between these geese forever entering and these spiders turning back, this astonishing delay, the everyday, takes place. Uh, in our lecture on early 17th century poetry, we saw how the metaphysical style connected, sometimes violently, disparate ideas that seemingly had no relation to each other and then cleverly make it make sense. And here we see a similar kind of connection, a form of, of reference, or rather relevance as the poem says, the geese have a powerful relevance to the speaker that arouses fear, it seems. And this is the fear, the fear of the, of the spiders. Um, not fear of spiders in the sense of being of arachnophobia, but rather the fear the spiders have. Now connecting um, this back 
the spiders are the ones who bind and bind the pins to the lines. And this, the spiders are what are near at hand. The geese overhead, spiders doing the same thing, performing the same action near at hand. Binds and binds the pins to the lines, the lines to the eaves, to the pincushion bush, as if at any time things could further fall apart and nothing could help them recover their meaning. Connecting back to modernist poetry, this anxiety that things must hold together is what we find in this poem, I think. The signifiers no longer have recourse to a larger signification, but are instead dependent upon each other in this rhizomatic network of association. Then the, the search for truth and meaning is, I think, replaced by a discovery of the fabric of verbal interconnectivity and interdependence. Of course, things further fall apart we had Yeats last week, and here we have Yeats again. Yeats is the second coming, of course, is what's referred to here. He has that line, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed over the world. The figure of the spider itself has threads to other poetic traditions. So we have Yeats in the modernist movement, but we also have Whitman's noiseless patient spider in which the spider becomes an emblem of the poet's soul. I just want to draw your attention to this. This is great for uh, Whitman's idea of the poet. A noiseless patient spider I marked where on a little promontory it stood isolated. Marked how to explore the vacant vast surroundings it launched forth filament, filament, filament out of itself, ever unreeling them, ever tirelessly speeding them. And you, O oh my soul, where you stand, surrounded, detached, in measureless oceans of space, ceaselessly musing, venturing, throwing, Seeking the spheres to connect them till the bridge you will need to be formed, till the ductile anchor hold, till the gossamer thread you fling catch somewhere. Oh, my soul. The gossamer thread of poetry, like the lines of the migratory geese and the spiders in, in um, Jory Graham's poem, The Geese, are flinging in motion not so much in destination. By the way, I know we're, the focus isn't Whitman here, but I just have to point out how the noiseless patient spider, comma, dependent clause, main noun, this actually grammatically makes this parenthetically uh, describe I. And then it's actually, no, no, I marked. And mark, of course, the act of writing. Uh, I marked but also observation where on a little promontory it stood isolated. So you've got that self-division that happens in the language and in the mind of the poet himself. Uh, just beautiful. Of course, it's rhapsodic in the way Whitman um, is. Now, I just want to return to this before we move on. If these spiders had their way, and if these spiders had their way chain link over the visible world, would we be in or out? I turn to go back in. Interesting modulation between uh, plural and singular. There's a feeling the body, the body gives the mind of having missed something, a bedrock poverty, like falling without the sense that you are passing through the one world. There's that enjambment there. Um, the geese, the geese forever enter. Somewhere in between, the geese forever entering and these spiders turning back. Of course, it's very much like how she turns back. I turn to go back in. Notice she doesn't say, I go back in. 
which would be her arriving at a destination or crossing a threshold. But she turns to go back in. The action she wishes to perform not yet complete within the language itself. And the spiders turning back. The geese forever entering. Um, the spiders turning back as she turns back. There's a semblance there. The, there seems to be an ambivalence in the speaker of this poem. She, I'm not sure what she feels. I hang out the wash, she says. I see, I fear, I turn. Perhaps the ambivalence of the speaker is one who wishes to keep you from looking to her lyrical eye as the focal point. The voice on the margins, yet intimate, they're not understood, not our point of reference. And how this poem ends takes place, suggests a spatial arrest. It means idiomatically we know to happen, something takes place, it means something happens. But the everyday just doesn't say happens. Literally, to take place, you might think to draw off or to take away or to possess, to take possession of, which is what I think the lines of poetry are attempting to do, or at least to take, to conserve, to hold together for a moment, the world in passing. Oh, but this is, this is interesting. The world thickens with texture instead of history, she said. Texture instead of place. And that's the second repetition of the word place. So it's fascinating. It's, it's very much a poem that answers itself and is drawing on and is repeating words deliberately um, to accumulate meaning with the same words each time it's, each time it's spoken. Now, uh, the critic Helen Vindler describes Amy Clampett's poetry, and I'm grateful for our Patreon friend uh, Fred for pointing this out to me. Uh, Helen Vindler has a beautiful quotation on the poetry of Clampett that I think holds true for, for um, a lot of contemporary poetry. Vindler says, a mere thread of language spanning the gulfs of the mind in the world. It is the definition of poetry that suits many of the 50 poems gathered in Clampett's collection, The Kingfisher. I think that definition is, of poetry is apt for our lecture today and for contemporary poets. And what I think contemporary poets have to do in order to be poets is a tough job, I think, now to be a poet than it ever was. Um, it, it, it has an entirely different set of criteria from the metaphysical poets or, or even the neoclassical poets. And we see it navigating this, taking on agency in this world. Now, in the last section of this lecture, I want to turn to Susan Howe's collection, Frolic Architecture. It's in a book called That This, which itself is a slim volume, a collection of collections, really. And Frolic Architecture is one of those collections within the book, That This. Now, Frolic Architecture is made up of collaged fragments of the private writings of the Jonathan Edwards family papers at the Beinecke Rare Book Library. And as a case study in contemporary poetry, Howes is fascinating in that it directly engages with a kind of logocentrism, with the logocentric interpretation of nature put forth by the 18th century American theologian, Jonathan Edwards. You might know him by his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, where uh, a lot of American um, high schoolers, middle schoolers will have to read this. He wrote other things, a large collection of things, actually. And one of the other books he published was Images of Divine Things, published in 1728. The Images of Divine Things is an exercise to interpret the natural world by heavenly truths and sometimes into heavenly truths. Edwards believed that there is a great and remarkable analogy, he said, in the works of God. And by that, he means nature. Things in nature are types, or they shadow forth truths of the, of the divine. For example, his book is a collection of, of these descriptions and how he, how he does that. And, and 
and he's looking at different types of nature. And one, he's looking at a still lake. And in, instead of Wordsworth thinking it's a beautiful picture of divine tranquility, Edwards will read the lake, the beautiful still lake, as representing the shadow for sin or a type for sin. It looks still on the surface, but its waters are dark and dangerous. Now, this is what I mean by the analogy. He sees Christ in the silkworm. He sees the silkworm as a type of picture of Christ. Stormy waves uh, are a picture of God's wrath and so on. The things of the world become signifiers of the divine things. And the shadows uh, and the things themselves represent uh, these divine truths. So it's classic logocentric thought. And of course, now I'm calling back to our lecture on the classical backgrounds with the Greeks. We talked about Plato's uh, philosophy of the cave and his theory of the ideal world and the ideal forms. And also the, the uh, lectures on the Bible backgrounds, especially lecture two, which considered how poets read the Bible through typology. And this is a different kind of typology. Instead of reading a text typologically, namely scripture, this is applying it to nature, but it relies upon the same stable logocentrism of Western Judeo-Christian and Platonic thought. So Howe's frolic architecture uh, begins with this poem. The title frolic architecture comes from a line in Ralph Waldo Emerson's poem, The Snowstorm, when he's describing the elemental whiteness and the fury of the, of the storm. And we just celebrated uh, Emerson's birthday with a reading of poems. Um, we didn't think much of the poems that we read, but it was great fun uh, reading them. The snowstorm is a good one. But listen to this astonishing poem. This begins the collection. That this book is a history of a shadow that is a shadow of me mystically one in another, 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 to subserve. It's disarming in its structure. Unforbidding. Like something we would find in a Congregationalist hymnal or one of Emily Dickinson's poems or any you know, Protestant hymnal, really. It's, hymn, it's hymnotic, certainly within the tradition of hymnody. Susan Howe, being a New England poet, of course, interested in this tradition and within it. This poem seems on one hand to embrace the Derridian post-structural understanding of reality. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that that's the purpose of the poem. But on one hand, I do think it's embracing the post-structuralist understanding of reality, that there is no transcendental referent, only an endless process of difference. The difference are the difference of meaning within a network of associations violently dislocated from their original context and rearranged to our perceptions into new meanings and associations. On the other hand, it has this transpersonal, almost transcendental flight. The second pair of lines seems to locate the speaker's identity within a network of others, the holy other perhaps, or the, the thou of, of Martin Buber's I-thou relationship, the self-positing ego of, of the German romantics or the German idealists, does not exist here. There's no place for that. The ego is posited into another. That's where it finds its meaning. Mystically, one in another, another, another. Thinking again of our theme of connections for this lecture, this mystical one and another, 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 to subserve, verges on a religious ethic, and a, rather a spiritual ethic, I think, of a corporate interdependence, not unlike the religious ethic of the Western philosophical traditions of Judeo-Christian logocentric theology. It seems at times that the postmodern poems, sometimes like this one, find ways to heal the wound. They find their way back to Avalon in an interesting way. Heal the wounds caused by fragmentation of the modern experience and, and this experience which so shocked the modernists into utterance. Now let me show you, finally, one of her other poems from Frolic Architecture.
I have a video of her reading these poems uh, when she came to Harvard. I'm going to post that in the Patreon and in the description below. The as yet Earl caught moon ren e hang poised if rift and air nor had oh, he far reaches Earl at oath land and u at and or swim e and flu of things odds for o. Oh, How do you closely read this poem? I'm going to recite it again because I'm not really satisfied with what I did in the middle there. The as yet oak in moon rin e hang poised if rift and air nor had he far reaches earl at oath land and u at n or swim e and flew of things oh odds for you think what words are complete here and what are suggested that might be one way we can closely read this poem we have moon hang poise air nor had this is its own text i think it's its own font as well differentiated from I think this invisible line here, we have at least a larger typeface, maybe a different font, but it's it's a different utterance, I think. And we have these where they're running um, adjacent, invisibly. So we have oath, land, and uh, you have possibly drift again, going back to Bergball. Of course, he's not doing that, but drift, rift. That's a significant word for this poem, rift, in a different voice. Uh, and then this statement, he far reaches, redolent of possibility as well, as the he could be the subject that reaches, or is it the final two letters of a larger word, like the, and is reaches, instead of a verb, a noun. It could just be the far reaches, and we just don't have the T. Oath, land, and what we complete, people uh, you know, familiar with the idioms of English will complete both land and sea. Okay, but that's not there. The B is absent, if that's what it is, and so is the C. Taken all together, I think, this collage, this poem, evokes an image of a nightscape in the moon. Uh, it, it also collectively suggests a global oceanic breadth with this global and cosmic scene with wide terrestrial distance, the far reaches, and possibly even oceanic breadth with the absence of sea, which our minds supply, or at least mine did. The sea was there, even though it wasn't. Oh, that's strange. It's these poems have a spectral presence both on the page and in our reading of it. Startling and haunting. These poems were made with she was she cut them up with scissors, put them together with invisible scotch tape, and copied them on a Canon copier with scraps of paper flattened and rearranged to make the poems. This kind of poetry takes words and phrases from their larger context, in this case, the private writings of the Edwards family and places the shards in disjointed colloquy. And the reading of these poems reproduce, I think, the psychological process of meaning-making, uh, of translating our sensory experience of the social and natural worlds, which are sometimes fragmented, into something with meaning. So that this is, is a wonderful collection of, of poems, I find. And they even, uh, one of them, even takes a, a portion of Psalm 55, which we saw in our lecture on um, Mary Sidney Herbert. Um, sorry, I can't help but smile at the comment. The bottom text seems to be a reflection of the sea. Oh, Cam, yeah, very interesting. So Cam suggests 
that this is a reflection, the perpendicular uh, lineation, which is invisible, could be the reflection. Let me see, possibly a, a horizon here. And Robert, I'm admiring the enthusiasm, the enthusiasm, but for me, Susan Howe is about as enjoyable as a toothache. You might enjoy the performance, Robert. Um, I, I just wanted to share that, you know, because there's a diversity of reactions to this stuff. I remember when I first read Susan Howe, I had to teach it before I read it. It was coming up on this course I was teaching. And I got it and I thought, oh, come on, this can't be poetry. And I was really grumpy about it. Um, but I was two pages in before she completely sold me. It was absolutely um, an experience for me. Um, so, yeah, it's different. It's not everyone's cup of tea. But this will be this will be fun to dig a little bit more in the discussion, I think. So, in conclusion, contemporary poetry, you know, we've seen it shed its traditional concern with communicating a singular meaning, and it's embraced this fragmented reality um, through deconstructionist uh, techniques and critiques, and a focus on the networks of association. These poems challenge easy categorization and invite this active participation. You know, one of my students, we were reading this, complained that, look, the poet's supposed to do all the work, not me. And as a reader, I think we can sometimes get a little frustrated with not even poetry of this kind, but also the poetry of John Donne, where it's like, they're expecting us to do too much. But I think that's, that's kind of the, the dialogic interaction uh, in this process of creativity the active participation in the creation of the poem. Yet even here, the human impulse to connect is able to bring together disparate elements of experience in text into a whole work of art, the possibility of this transpersonal flight and a sense of connection that transcends the individual is, I think, a possibility that much contemporary poetry still entertains. So this concludes our crash course through the traditions of English poetry. Special thanks to my patrons uh, who sponsored these videos and lectures, have attended them, and joined me afterwards each week for discussion and contribution. For everyone on YouTube, thanks for watching, and until next time.